it was me doing a lot of work on me first because I knew I had to heal because to be an effective leader, you have to know how to lead and you have to know when and how to follow. And I did not want to be that leader because most people don't need toxic jobs, they need toxic bosses. And so I didn't want to be that toxic person. I've already had that moment when I wasn't acknowledging what was going on with me. And I was like, thank God for friends that I got that still love me. But now it's time that you gotta wake up. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of How Do You Medicine, brought to you by yours truly, Dr. Nancy Joseph, aka the Dynamic Doc. And this is where we talk to different um, health professionals from different backgrounds, different areas of medicine about their journey and how do they medicine because um, they're doing medicine their way. So today um, on our How Do You Medicine podcast, we have Dr. Kidesh Sharif. And we will call her Dr. Kiki, affectionately so. Um, so Dr. Kiki is a multilingual award-winning physician. And she's also the founder of Doctors Under the Radar, which we'll talk more about later. But in terms of her academic journey, she got her bachelor's in uh, two, two degrees, two bachelor's degrees, um, biomedical sciences or biological sciences, excuse me, and also psychology. And she got those at Rutgers. Uh, in New Brunswick. And then she went on to get a biomedical master's in biomedical science um, in Rowan. And then as a, as like myself, a woman after my own heart, she is also a DO. And so she got her doctor of osteopathic medicine um, at Rowan School of Osteopathic Medicine and went on to do a family medicine residency at uh, Wright Center for Graduate Medical Education. So that's kind of the, you know, her academic um, um, training, so to speak. However, um, right before she started medical school, actually, she ended up being hit by a car and determined to go on. You know, a lot of people be like, oh, man, what happened then? What happened is she went to med school. So um, determined to uh, go on and being resilient, persevering, especially being as the first person in her family to go to med school, she uh, pressed on, went to medical school, completed medical school, and then, of course, went on to complete residency. Um, however, you know, of course, the accident did take its, its toll. Uh, she started, um, got, she later got diagnosed with generalized anxiety, got diagnosed with PTSD. Um, we'll talk more about the mental health part of her journey today, but her accolades really continue even beyond residency. Um, she kind of had an interest in uh, mental health before uh, had uh, that, that happened in her journey, uh, as denoted by, of course, her degree in psychology, but it further fueled, the accident further kind of fueled her um, passion for mental health um, because then she started or founded actually Doctors Under the Radar, really, which is a startup um, focusing on the mental health of uh, medical school, uh, of physicians and med from medical school and beyond. And from that particular brand, she starts a um, podcast called Doc You Are, which I have had the distinct pleasure of uh, guesting, of being a guest on. And Doc You Are podcast is really just a, a space for candid conversations um, with uh, various medical professionals about mental health and really with the, with the goal of destigmatizing uh, physician mental health. So that's one side of the accomplishment. This woman is a trailblazer. Moving forward, she also was named as one of the um, 13 entrepreneurs to look out for going into 2021 um, by Black Girl Ventures. She's been on uh, numerous features, including uh, Wired Magazine, Beyond Normal Podcast, and so much more. We'll talk more about that journey. And then that, that's just her like blazing trails, inspiring. And then... As a leader, she is an advisor um, to aspiring MDs. She is a founder and president to a nonprofit, um, which is a young woman's empowering nonprofit organization called uh, Orthodox Gems, and that's G-E-M-S, all uh, capitalized. So like, so Dr. Kiki, like I said, is a trailblazer, change agent, um, and she continues to have numerous initiatives to um, help inspire and heal and empower her community, which is what we all about here 
on the doc, uh, the dynamic doc brand and specifically in this podcast. And we'll learn much, much more about her journey here. Welcome to our podcast, Dr. Kiki. Hey, Dr. Nancy. <laughs> so oh, we're just going to listen. We're going to get into it because let me tell y'all, go ahead and put, put buckle your seatbelts <laughs> and go ahead and turn down whatever you got to turn down in this room. Also, she is um, a Caribbean gal like myself from Jamaica. Yeah. So my accent will probably be stronger in this podcast episode yeah. than in previous episodes because that tends to happen when I'm around a Caribbean girls like myself. So let us get started. First, yes. let's just start with the beginning because the beginning is, you know, we all remember how we started in medicine because the, the interest was there in the beginning, you know, early on in our lives. However, there's the interest and then there's the doing, which we'll really touch on in various uh, aspects in this podcast. But talk to us about here you are in the beginning of your journey, getting that acceptance letter and officially becoming the first person in your family to be going into medical school. Talk about the goods and the bad of that or the pressures, maybe. So you already know as a, island person the pressures are huge because you have to do something with your life in our right. family there is no excuse for anything and back in the day it was always college 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 and then you figure out what you're going to do afterwards mm -hmm. um so for me it was it was it never felt like pressure it I just knew what I had to do um okay. my family was one of trailblazers in which I was just like all right so I had no excuse and that was a pressure so my dad what, did NJIT, he did electro, electrical engineer in three years for a oh. four-year course in okay. which he, he started uh, an organization, the West Indian um, Student Organization. He did track and field, he tutored, and he still graduated summa cum laude. Um, and he started school that Monday and pretty much came from Jamaica that Friday. So oh, wow. culture shock and everything. Thing. living in what was it the Bronx traveling two hours one way to get to school so you know island people and the stories is like when back in my day I had to travel like walk 10 miles it's like my dad literally has those stories and it's like oh it. wow that's crazy <laughs> wow that's crazy already okay yes my mom um she did some college in Jamaica and then she came here and she started uh Essex County here but the credits didn't transfer over so she couldn't finish community college and it like crushed her but nonetheless she became a teacher um the teacher the principal saw my mom's connection when she dropped off my brother and then I and then like numerous of our family members at the center and she saw how she communicated with the kids and like kids that were nervous to go to strangers would go to her and she got the job based on that, just based on merit, based on my mom's ability to nurture um, people. And she became one of like pretty much a top teacher every year. And she was able to work with dyslexic, disabled, autistic kids and get them to actually stay in the grade that they're supposed to be in versus oh, nice. stay behind. So my mom has that. And then <laughs> my brother, we were always competitive, but it was never the competition as... Um, anything materialistic or um, anything extra in which we fought each other for, it was always, he got an A, I had to get an A. And mind you, he's two grades above me. So if he did something, I had to do something too. We played sports together and like typical Trump tomboy because older brother, I look up to him or whatever. Um, we played just about every sport together. And um, he pretty much had a house before he even graduated college, started a business in college with his friends, which he still owns to this day. And then he got into real estate. He has two masters. Well, he did the two masters because I have two degrees. So it was kind of like, <gasps> right. he even thought oh about being a doctor. <laughs> You're like, I, I, I have two bachelors, like, like, two masters. <laughs> That's how we are. So right. I even took him to the cadaver lab in medical school. And he was just like, yo, I'm really thinking about getting my degree. I was like, bruh stick to your business and do whatever you gotta do this is a whole different life form and it's not just the kicks and giggles you know so 
having that lineage and that legacy in my family, it was kind of always like, you know, find your place. My parents never put pressure on us. They always okay. just said, know where you have to go, know what you want to do and stick to it. So mean what you say and say what you mean. So, you know, it was always ensuring that I did what I did. But from the age of two, I said I wanted to be a doctor. I don't remember saying it, but that's the story everybody tells me. <laughs> um, and I did spend my life all throughout. Um, from middle school, I was in pipeline programs. High school, every summer, I was in internships. And in college, you know, I did summer courses and internships so that I can, like, can't, like not stay behind and do certain things. So it was kind of, like, always there. So it's kind of like when I became a doctor, people were just like, oh, my God, you're a doctor. But then it's like, okay, what's next? And I'm like, can I just enjoy being a doctor? Mm -hmm. You know, can I just revel in this moment in time? But they were just so used to me doing something, me being involved in something, that it just became normal for them to see me achieving um, and, it's, and then it was like, I got my master's and it was like, aren't you going to be a doctor? I was like, yeah, but I'm going to master's first. And then I became a doctor and they're just like, do you have a life? And I'm like, yeah, I travel. <laughs> like, I do a whole bunch of stuff. But it was just like in our community, they're not used to seeing so much of that, especially for us that are first generation, uh, whether for you Haitian, me, Jamaican, um, or um, any of the Caribbean and even some other non-Americans our parents are used to surviving. So our generation is like, we want to more than survive, we want to thrive. So when it comes on to doing more, it's like, it's second nature, not necessarily to put the pressure on ourselves, but to ensure we're setting ourselves up for a better future. And so that's kind of how I looked at it. And it was always motivational for me because the outside noise, which are people outside my family, they, that was pressure. But I've learned to ignore that and just, you know, focus on who's there to uplift me and constructively criticize me. Because you, you know, I'm people. They're not always nice, but it's the constructive criticism that has helped me through. Um, long story short. Constructive criticism. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's the constructive part that's important, not necessarily the criticism part. Don't be criticizing everybody just because you can. Um, well, I girl, so. but the, well, in general, um, okay, so then it you know, we're preparing, get the acceptance letter, we're starting med school, we're so excited, and then you are on your was it your, your bike, right? Yeah, that you so, so like, walk us through, like, I guess, a very concise snippet of so you're just just like crossing the street, you're like, what happened? I moved in that week before medical school started and I pretty much was just riding my bike to get to know the area and start like a physical exercise routine for myself. And I got to a crosswalk. I'm in South Jersey, so you know in country roads are like big and wide. And so I was like, I was in the right of way. The light was red and I was crossing. I stopped, everybody stopped. And as I'm taking off, like, it's a good distance, but like, you know, like countryside, like the stop sign is like 10 feet away from the crosswalk. And so the lady like looks to the left. She doesn't look back right and like jams into me. And I end up rolling on top of her car, falling on the floor. My bike ended up on under her, her car. Um, and the beauty of that was there was a cop right behind her car, directly behind her oh, car. Oh, wow. Yeah. Only do and, it. Listen. Of <laughs> the proper so, shirt today. I knew we had yeah. to follow God a few times during this podcast. Had my, yes. my, my appropriate it, shirt on there. So she, she came out the car. She's frazzled. She is going hysterical. And I'm calming her down. <laughs> I'm oh, so you got floor. up. You're like, okay. No, I'm on the floor calming, calming her, down. her down. I'm like, man, it's okay. And like me being the nerd that I am, I pull out my first aid kit and I'm like wiping off. Not the your first aid kit. <laughs> no, get she out. Comes now and she tries to take stuff and she's wiping my leg. Like she's now abusing my leg because she's nervous. Her hands are shaking and like she's pressing hard. And I'm just like, uh, it's okay. I'm all right. 
and this is summer so it was hot so the ground is hot she's kneeling on the floor and she's like I can't handle this do you want to come in my car so she puts me in her car with the air on she's calling her son I almost killed this young girl and she's telling me she's she got into medical school I almost killed a doctor so she's getting more hysterical and I'm just like lady like I'm fine I'm okay and so they call the ambulance the fire truck everything and I'm like I'm good I'm gonna go home they're like ma'am you need to stay and this guy with the thickest country accent and I'm like huh what are you saying so he's like and so he holds me and he's like I need to hold your neck straight and I'm like sir oh, yeah. I've been moving he's like I need and so it was just like big ordeal and they finally got me into the ambulance and I'm like I kid you not I will never do another ambulance ride the worst ride of my life there's no shocks no springs so you're feeling every bump every turn everything and I'm like how are people that are actually worse off than me supposed to get to the hospital in one piece? What hurts them more, the actual trauma or the ride? And they're all like going crazy. Like we're just having fun in the back laughing. Um, but with all seriousness, um, it turned out that I had a lot of ailments. Um, throughout my first year, I was in and out the hospital because they were checking me for DVTs. After one point, my legs were swollen. They were, I did multiple MRI, CT scans. Um, cause I had herniated this. They wanted to make sure it didn't propulse, which means like to, you know, the, this actually fully exposed out the sac. Um, I had patellofemoral syndrome, osteoarthritis, like, uh, 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 frac not a fracture, but like a, well, a hairline fracture on my arm. And, but I started that Monday. I got hit Friday, started that Monday. And for those who don't know, DVTs are like deep vein oh, thrombosis, okay. which is just blood <laughs> clots. Blood like clots yeah. and various, like in the deep, yeah. deeper veins, which um, and can can just present, just look like a lot of pain wherever that clot is, and then because blood can't get past that clot, then it causes a lot of swelling. So you did, they were checking you for DVTs, or you ended up having some DVTs? No, they checked me because my legs started getting swollen, and then they were also lumpy and bumpy. So they were stressed out about it because they were just like you know, and I was having extreme pain. So it was. DVT, deep vein thrombosis, and then they started to stress about compartment syndrome, which pretty much is when your leg swells up because blood is being pulled into specific compartments of like underneath the fascia, the muscle, like underneath the layers, and it has nowhere to go. So they were really worried about me. And it was, I mean, that was a lot of pain. And so it was just basically boiled down to like some kind of confusion or injury to my muscles and the arteries the nerves and the veins around it um so that was first year second year i was in and out of the medical examiner's um office acupuncture uh omm because you know osteopathic manip manipulations because we're in school for that and it got to the point where they started like saying we don't know what to do with you my advisors and mentors that took the time to work on me while the medical examiners are like we see nothing wrong with you so we're going to drop you from this case. And I'm just like, they're writing to you saying I need more care, physical therapy and everything, but you're going to drop me based on what? So I had to struggle with that in and out. And there was a pain in my shoulder that just would not go away. No amount of OMM would save it, no amount of anything until they did multiple sessions of um, acupuncture. And through all that time, one of my mentors was like, you're a prime example of how the system failed its patients. It's just sad that you're a doctor but take that with you and forever remember that. And it hit me, you know, because it's true. Um, I needed the care. My insurance, you know, it soon would have to come out of my pocket. Like, why are you dropping me? It's not even a good year yet and you're dropping me. Um, third year, I was in and out because I wasn't holding food down. I lost like 20 pounds in one month at one point. Water, I wasn't holding water down. I was just not doing too good. And one doctor was like, we're gonna start working up for cancer because nothing else makes sense. Um, and we're chalking it up to my allergies, to stress, and I'm a female, my period, um, everything under the sun, except for what could be psychosomatic, which basically means like my mind and my body are not communicating properly. Um, and so fourth year, I'm now really struggling. I'm not sleeping. I diagnosed with insomnia. Um, you know, I'm still taking, I have gastric emptying studies. I've had um, more CTs, MRIs. I had um, an EGD done. I had 
uh, a that's scope. That's when they down your esophagus. That put down a scope when they look up the other end. Mm-hmm. I've had all these procedures done while in medical school um, wow. because they're trying to figure out what's wrong with me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so that's lasting all throughout, but I'm still in medical school because my motto was I survive. Um, so someone else is worse off than me. And this is all while I'm doing two fellowships and I'm traveling. I've done like rotations in Mass. I did rotations in Maryland. I did rotations in DC all over. I started a nonprofit. That's when I started it. I was a part of SNMA. I went from historian to vice president. I was a part of our student run um, health clinic. I was a part of like a lot of things. Like I was keeping myself busy and I think that was my brain's way of ignoring or not paying attention to what was going on with me. And it wasn't until residency in which everything hit the fan. Um, Cause you know, we need a board's passing score step three to, to make it. And I wasn't, but I was doing good in clinics. Like patients love me, staff love me. I was one of the, the doctors that we got into clinic, even if it was a hundred patients, I was getting out on time. I wasn't, you know, and I still, you know me, I like to build relationships with my patients, understand everything about them, and even sometimes do um, OMM on them. But I was I was efficient, but on paper, I was failing. I was horrible. So they did a psychoanalysis on me, found out I had severe depression, PTSD, anxiety, and later I found out I had ADHD. And that was pretty much the beginning of my downfall. So when I started off doing my journey in medicine, it was like elation, happiness, But then by the time I was done with my journey, it was just, I I was worthless, homeless, hopeless, like everything to think of. And I just, I didn't care. I didn't want anybody to call me a doctor. Like if you called me a doctor, it was just like, no, that's not, that's not my title. Don't, I don't want to think about anything in medicine. Is it because of just what you've gone through? You were just like, oh. Yeah, it was an altered mind state, right? Um, You have this journey and. Like I said, I didn't have boards passing score. When I got diagnosed, I should have taken a break. But my options were continue, take your boards and see what happens or take a break and we won't really know what's going to happen. So of course, being strong and everything, but everybody knew my diagnosis. I shouldn't have had options. It should have been like conversations in which it was more like, well, your options are either take a break and do X or take a break and do Y. Um, because nobody in my physician, ADHD, not on meds, depressed, anxious, everything can sit for a nine hour exam, which is what our boards are. Um, So I pretty much, after that, I had to leave and I got into DC, which is the number one area I wanted to get in. You know, that's not easy. Um, I almost didn't even match to get it. I found out I matched the day of match and you know how like rare that is. So my whole story is just like all types of discombobulated um and so that's true I, and by, by match she means that's the process for those who don't know matches the process in which medicine um, as a medical school student you get into residency so what happens is you interview in all these residency programs you put in your list in ranking order as far as where you want to go then all the programs rank all the applicants that came to their program in the same similar order of how they, you know, would prefer them to match into their program. And then the match part comes with if, uh, you know, if I'm on a list of a program that is, that is also on my list, so your lists match. So, you know, if program number one is, my, is, is if my, my program that I prefer, if I'm on their list, then I match into that program. And then it's kind of like the centralized system that does their computerization. And then boom, you match. Yay, there's this whole like celebration because there can also be a, 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 um, an instant where I put all these programs on my list and I'm too far down on their list. And like, let's say I'm, they have 20 positions and they put 26 people and I'm number 25 and all of their 20 people that they matched, put them on their list. So that means none of the programs I wanted, I wasn't high enough on their list. So then now you don't match and now you have to scramble, they call it where you have to figure out, okay, which program has an open spot that can, I could take me last minute. So that's what happens. You know, the good, the, the less stressful you match and the not so stress, the more stressful, excuse me, the much more stressful, I didn't match, what do I do now process. So um, Dr. Kiki saying she did end up matching, although it was a, like usually you find out 
earlier in that week, and she found out like at the end that she up. matched into family. Mexico. I didn't know. Match, oh, the day up scramble. I just matched the day up, which wow. was funny because it was the day before my birthday, so it was very interesting. But I was going to show up anyways because I was showing up to support my friends, like regardless. And they said that regardless, you're going to get an envelope. You just know that there's nothing in the envelope. Um, and so it was just and by like, show up, she means to the match ceremony. Yeah. So I was going to go. I was getting dressed. And as I was getting dressed, they called me and interviewed me the day of. So it was just kind of like, <laughs> and then I got in. They called me. It was like, I will call you back. And then I got Won't he do it? Won't he do it? And hey. in all honesty, I failed step one. I failed step Did two. You? Yes, I th- and not just once. I think I failed step one, two, five. My oh, baby, baby. Like, I, I don't. I just know it was more than once. And the second, the, when I did step two, what happened was I went away to the past program, and that's when I got my highest. Like I got high five hundreds out of champagne, what? right? Yeah, champagne. Yeah, out of like six hundred. Champagne, champagne. Yeah, champagne. You champagne know i know good. about that city so later mm-hmm. on like skipping ahead like 10 years later they're like you realize you passed because you had no outside distractions it was like that's pretty much adhd like day in and day out you were focused like that program did you, know, you do that program, program before sorry to cut you off you did the program be- like after the second try or after how many tries i don't know one what try it was but i did fail before i did it and they were just like all right we tied this like you know, you need to go do something about it. And I'm just saying, like, the amount of money I spent on boards, which is like, you know, the exams are like $800 each. I could have like a car, a, a, a great vacation, something. So, you know, it was just like, let me just do it. And it cost me something, but let me just do it. Um, and so it was kind of like my experience getting into residency was like, was bumpy, traumatic. Getting into medical school was traumatic. And here I am at the end still being traumatic. And when I was diagnosed, I, w- I learned that I had to leave. And, you know, because I was on academic probation, you know, they were constantly monitoring me or whatever. And it came down to the point where it was just like, all right, your second fail, you've got to go. And when that for happened- For what? Residency? From residency. And then I for found out- For step three, the second fail for what? Step three. Step three. Oh, okay. step three. And then a couple months later, I found out I was pregnant, three months pregnant. And the relationship that I was in was not working. And um, I was just like, no, it's depressed and sad as I am. I'm good. I'm going to, you know, we're, we can co-parent. We can do everything. But I don't want to be in a relationship anymore. So I'm jobless, homeless, hopeless. And I'm a mama. And that is where I turned myself around. Because I figured I can't tell my son to aim for the stars, to be all you can to do it all and I'm quitting and I know I'm quitting not based on my own condition but because of an altered mental state and so I started waking up early to exercise I drank more water ate my fruits you know was cooking more walked every day like probably sometimes in the morning and in the afternoon because I would go again with my parents and I'm like I just turned my life around because it was just like you know I can say I wasn't suicidal, but I did sit there and say, well, what's the point of living and what's the point of life if I don't? Like, during all this, I'm applying for jobs, but I'm too qualified for just about everything else, but underqualified to be a doctor, even though I had two years of residency under my belt. And so, you know, throughout my pregnancy too, when I left, I was too far gone for most doctors in Jersey to take me. So I had to scramble for weeks for prenatal care. So I had gaps in prenatal care. I left um, residency in July and I didn't get prenatal care till like September. And as a physician, I was three months in April. So then six months in um, July because he came November and I was 42 weeks when he was, um, when he was born. Post, okay. So he was like, I'm gonna be in there time. for a while. Let me get And he was, he was happy. He was like, Ma, I see the stress you're going through. I see what the world has to offer me. And I'm a black boy, keep me in the oven. Yeah. Um, so so it was it was a lot of stress. It was a lot, and I and I had to turn to the government for government assistance, 
And I'm sitting here like, what? Even when I went into the office, they were like, you're unique. I was like, I'm tired of hearing I'm unique. They was like, we've never seen a doctor really at your age, your first child in here. They was like, we don't expect you to be on this long because it don't make sense. It don't add up. And so I was just like, I'm only here because I'm pregnant and I can't start working now because who's going to take a pregnant lady for a couple weeks and then let her go? And so they were just like, well, you know, we're going to do what we have to do to help you out and take care of you. So now I'm on government assistance, unemployed, doctor, master's degree, all of that. And it was hard with my mental health. It was, I'm not going to lie, it was hard. But the one thing throughout everything was like my faith when I just saying, God, there has to be a reason for this. God, you, you, won't, you better use me as a tool, a vehicle, a story, a, you know, an example. I don't care because this is a lot. This is, I know you say you give everybody a cross they can care, but what kind of cross are you giving me? Um, so, but even though I questioned everything, it was still like certain things are just not the answer. And so I kept pushing through. And as you can see, I'm here now, but I mean, there's more in between, but I feel like I was talking enough. Um, so so <laughs> like, to answer your question and more, um, it, was, it was rough on my mental health. Yeah, and I think, so a couple of things. Number one, yeah, you, it's, sometimes it's hard in the, throughout the challenges in the midst of it to understand, okay, God, I'm in the test. I feel that I'm in the test. I know that I'm in the test. So I'm just going to have faith that the testimony is going to be something great because the greater the test, the greater the testimony. And so, uh, you know, the greater the challenge, the greater the triumph. And so, you know, that there, that, you know, David is as big as he is because of how big his Goliath was. Mm. Um, And so sometimes we want somebody, we want something our size, right? But then your muscles just aren't as big, right? You you can be, you can be toned, but you won't be chiseled if you just keep up, keep picking up them five pounders. I mean, you'll be fine. It won't be as hard, but your muscles won't be as big. But in the process, You know, again, as you so eloquently put, hey, I was like, I went from elated to depressed, going from excited to, um, you know, anxious, you know, excited to anxious, elated to depressed, you know, hopeful to hopeless. Like that transition is really something that you have to find various resources and sources to kind of pull you out of. And so now going into how you ended up, because a lot of people could say, you know, man, this is my journey. And this is why I think mental health is important. The end. But again, talk about, you know, channeling what you went through, the pain, the test, the the stress um, from all angles, from the academic being like, but no, sis, versus, and, and really the society and um, the government and things that were supposed to be put in place to help being more of, again, a stumbling block, taking all of that. And yeah, again, you can walk around with your testimony and you can do talks, right? Which a lot of, you know, doctors do talks and things like that. But talk about going from the, um, the challenge to triumph and turning all of that into a brand that you now have. What, what was that process? Was that a mental process? Was that something you had planned on doing anyway? Or how did how did that come about? Girl, I had no plan to do this. None. Um, okay. I knew I I'm you have to know your strengths and your weaknesses. And I know at some point I couldn't work for somebody, but it was always like, oh, I'm gonna do a clinic or oh, I'm gonna do X, Y, and Z. Um, because I love patient care. I love getting in the room and trying to do like, you know, MacGyver, but instead we're like Doogie Hauser and trying to figure things out. Um, for those, I mean, I am an 80s baby, so Doogie Howser, you know, smart as Right, fun. that's true. I keep forgetting. I was like, uh-huh, uh-huh, but like, oh, so people like, who? Or Chicago Med, or whatever those shows are. You can spell it. It was like, a younger um, version of House, a younger, yes. nicer version. House, here we go. A um, younger, but, nicer yes. version of House. Yes. Although How, House and his, his character is a genius. But he just mm-hmm. his bedside manners. But well, people don't come to him for bedside manners. They come to no, him. They come for results. So, um, so yeah, it was it was not this. Um, and I 
got back into clinical medicine, um, thank, thankfully, because once again, everything that I do is just not random. I went to pick up my mom and I was looking at her labs and I was saying, my, this is good, this is bad. And I'm like breaking it down to her. And I'm like, you need to do X, Y, and Z based on this. And you know, Caribbean mama. Yeah, but you know, yeah, but and I'm just like, nah, mom, this is what you got to do or else these are the consequences. And the doctor that I um, was just sitting there and I'm thinking she's working. And she was just like, your parents told me about you. It really oh. isn't your clinical care. It really isn't your bedside matter because I'm hearing your mama argue with you and you're not getting, you know, you're just sitting there talking to her and being patient. I'm like, oh, somebody call me patient? Girl, that's Ooh. the first. Um, <laughs> you said who's patient? What? You don't listen, mommy. And I wasn't doing that, you know? So um, she was just like, why don't you work with me for a little bit? Like intern and I'll help you study for your boards. And I was like, sure. I was like, I needed to get back to talking to adults. You know, it's been a year with my son and I'm like, I'm applying to jobs and not getting anywhere. And that's not me. I know I don't want to be a stay at home mom, not for me. Um, and so it turned from intern into working for her. So basically I was her associate medical director um, for about, three, four years. It was me coming there allowed her to have her first vacation in like seven years. Oh you know my. I mean? like, yeah, I got that. I'm not that. I was that efficient. I was that, you know, asset. So it was never my aptitude, my bedside manner. You know, even now when I talk to you, it's like patients still ask for you. So, you know, it it's not even one of those things where I'm too in my own horn because sometimes we forget how good we are. Like I said, I felt worthless and hopeless. And so it's just reminding yourself of your capability. So it was me just being able to say, all right, God, it's not that. So help me. And it, I still didn't feel fulfilled. I still felt like there was more I needed to do. There was more that I wanted to do. And there's more that I should do. And I kept saying it over and over to the few people that I did talk to because I came anti-social because I was tired of people asking me where I saw myself, what I wanted to do when I could rat it off easily in the past. I couldn't do that anymore. It was like, I don't know. My brother would be the main one saying, what do you mean you don't know? That's not good enough for me. He was like, yo, what is this? And I'm just like, I don't know. But as much as I was annoyed that he did it, his repetition of asking me that and our competitive nature in the past was one of the motivations and push to keep me out because someone constantly asking you what you're going to do, what you're going to do, you eventually have to give them an answer. And my brother is not one where you can just BS. He's like logical. He's like the calculator where he could put stuff in the air and move it around in his head and come back and be like in five seconds and be like, that, mm -mm, that doesn't make sense. So mm -hmm. he's always been my golden compass too. And it was like, in those moments, it was just kind of like, what do you want? I started having to answer those questions. What do you want? Who are you? What are you? Why? What is your why? What is your how? Um, it wasn't working out on that job anymore. So I transitioned to another job and I started thinking of all different things. I'm calling people. Every idea I come up with, I'm calling somebody. And they're just like, but you got to do this and this and this. I'm like, no, nah, that's too much work. <laughs> I'm still like in that lazy mind frame. I'm like, no, nah, too much work. No, that's going to be too much effort. No. <laughs> so, you know, I kept going. And then it was um, one of our mutual friends. Um, she was like, yo, I am so tired of you talking. So tired of you saying the same things over and over. Anytime we give you something, you take it, you do whatever, transform it, multiply in like no time. And she was just, I feel like you need something in front of you. Um, oh, Maggie. I'm like, I'm neutral. I figured that's what you're talking about. Yeah. So I just, like, and, I was um, just like, okay. <laughs> so let me give her her proper titles, Dr. McDonald Shirley. Um, and it was just like, she was like, hey, I'm over this. So she actually connected me with someone that works on her website. And she was just like, get this done. When she said that, I was like, yo, we never play with each other. You know, when you talk about people that hold no cut cards. So she was like, I don't want to hear nothing. Don't let me waste my time, which you have been doing all this time. I was like, dang, okay. And don't, don't let this fall. So that was like early May. May 25th is when I LLC'd my business. It took me that long to see her and say, oh, okay, Lord. And then the girl... Um, emailed me we went back and forth and we met July and by September you the saw girl, the, the website, the website developer um, you saw what whatever my website is now I did that in that time all of the information on the website was me 
Um, I took that time to do everything um, and set it up. And throughout the time, um, I'm learning business because doctors and business are like two opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah, I think I think we're th that a couple of um, pauses, a couple of like gems because you're just you know just dropping gems, kind of like breadcrumbs along the way. She's just <laughs> dropping gems, and then um, number one, you know, you have to know your strengths, you have to know your worth and you have to walk in those, you have to walk in knowing yeah. those. You have to walk in that knowledge. So, so it's one step to have knowledge. It's another thing to have actions. Mm -hmm. The difference between realizing something and dreaming something, the road or the distance between dreams and you know actual goals and actually living it is action. That's all that is. And so um, putting pen to paper, putting thought to paper is very, very important. However, what, one thing you really touched on is everyone's catalyst is different. Mm -hmm. Because every, everyone's, everyone has a dream, but everyone's dream doesn't get realized. Everyone has a life, but not everybody's living. Everyone, mm -hmm. ha you know, everyone has potential, but as we learned in... And uh, our science, um, our science studies potential has no vector, aka direction, right? Yeah, so just wild, everyone has wild. potential, but potential is not really a moving thing. It's just something that you can yeah. be. It's what you can be, but potential. In order to go from potential to velocity or to, to vector with a direction, that so you have to have a catalyst, much like a catalyst for non-science heads that are listening. A catalyst is something that you add to a reaction that makes it go faster. Without a catalyst, something could take 10 years to be, a reaction could take 10 years to actually finish. You add a catalyst and that could go down to like a year or two. Everybody's yeah. catalyst looks different. Some people, it's a lecture they go to. Some people, it's a TED talk they go to. Some people, it's that friend that keeps them accountable. Some people, it's that, it's the accident that happened. Some people, it's the, it's the rock bottom that they hit. Some people, it's the hopelessness they got. Some people, it's the child they had. They look in their eyes and say... Yep, no, can't can't keep doing this. We're gonna have to do something else. Mm -hmm. Um, so everybody's catalyst is different. And so it seemed for you, you you know, you found that you know internship that helped you get back into like the clinical world and all of that stuff. But a, another in the last gem for this uh, insertion is that your current place is not your is not your final destination, right? Mm -hmm. Your current your, your, your current position is not your final destination. And just because it's a comfortable position doesn't mean it's your final destination. So it's no, but you know, sometimes people can become complacent mm. because of their comfort. Complacency and comfort is the enemy of growth. And so just because you're in somewhere and it's, it's paying, um, gratefulness, of course, should always be there. But, um, but anyways, to have the internal note, you know, like to be like mm, this is cool however I want to do something different and then also taking heed to advice and being like all oh, right I should do something huh okay <laughs> let me do something just kidding so then <laughs> did you always so then where did you come up with the idea to well you know what I mean like to to for this brand docs under the radar doctors under the radar like Let's for a second talk to, you know, those who want to do, to want to build a brand, right? What's, that, what, what's even the first step to even like, do, is, it, is the first step the name or is the first step like, what, what is? The first step is researching what you want to do and okay. researching what it takes and under, like, get some kind of understanding about it. Um, I am a person of action and it. It is also kind of knowing, like I mentioned before, and you like reiterated, knowing your strengths and weaknesses, um, because I do know my strength is hands-on. Um, you give me an idea and I run with it. My weakness is I don't like micromanaging. I don't like the operational side, the everyday tasks and doing stuff. And you have to understand what that entails when you get into the business. Um, and I'm very very impatient um and I but am, the doctor said you were patient she caught me on the i don't know i probably was tired you know when you're tired you're <laughs> <thinking>. <laughs> um 
Um, I'm not, you know, and then there's the moment where it's just like, I'm very impulsive. I mean, when you read about Aries and impulsiveness, like that is really me. And so I had to learn that. And then my brother would always be like, you will have to learn politics, TQ, like your face, how you respond to people. Because with, with the accident, with my traumatic brain injury, oh, I got very apathetic. And it was just like, either you get it or you don't. Like, I'm I, I'm not going to say it twice. I don't like talking. I don't like repeating myself. So. And I don't care who it was, my program director. Yeah, I got in trouble a couple of times. Like oh. my program director was like, you are a minimalist and like you just come straight forward and blunt with things. And I was just like, yeah. And I think she was waiting for me. <laughs> like, so I've had these conversations. Like, you know, it was like, so uh, it was, okay. It was, All right. <laughs> it was learning how to go against those things. And it was also learning. Um, I got a coach. Um, girl, I ain't had a moment. kind of coach. It's um, important. Um, it. What was she? So this is another random moment in life. Um, I was one of my brother's friends who now is my friend. He always says I still his friends, but that's just life, right? Um, she was doing. She's doing series, and I was like logging into all of her series and whatever. And I was listening to someone who is a doctor, pedi- pediatrics. Did she double major? I don't remember. Because now it's like, we're cool and I don't remember her stats. You know, when you don't know somebody, like their stats or everything, like, oh my God. And then you get to know them. It's like, oh yeah, what are you again? A doctor, that's all that matters. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was listening to her and she struggled with dyslexia. Um, What is it? Convergence syndrome? Some, Some other things. And she like became a professional dealing with ADHD. And like whatever she said hit me. So I reached out to her and I was just like, I really want to connect and and like deal with you. And so that was something else I had to relearn. And that was what also helped me. Like I knocked on people's doors, like no tomorrow. I don't care what, I I hate writing emails. The subject line is always the worst for me, but I just connected because one, a closed mouth never gets fed. And two, you never know until you ask. And three, professionally, I don't tell myself no. So I got to figure it out and I got to ask people. And so I reached out to her and she was like, sure. Um, And then we meshed first. I got texted her and I was just like, hey, and I was like, do you mind coaching me? And she was like, fine. And then I told her my story and she was like, I know you're, you don't have it. So why don't you pay me what you can? And I was like, I like paying people what they're worth. Yeah, it's crazy, right? She was like, tell me what you think it's worth and we'll go on with that. And I was just like, what are your rates? Can you just tell me that? Like, that's just much easier for me. And if I could do a payment plan, we do what we got to do. So I paid her at her rate. And it, it took some time. You know, I was, I'm still on. Now, is it's that just, when you say coaching, career coach, life coach, like what? I couldn't tell you because we touched everything because we kind of built a relationship in it as well. Okay. And it was kind of like for me to just get within like to life, career, so like it was a little bit of everything. Um, and she got me to say I have ADHD, right? She got me to say, like, a lot of things that I was, like, holding in. I swallowed a lot from the accident. I wasn't expressing what was really going on with me, how I was feeling, how I was doing. And we both know that makes everything worse because it's that mind-body connection, especially mind-gut. And I have IBS. And I have gastritis. Irritable bowel syndrome, gastritis. those who don't know. No, I, yeah, I was going to say them. I have IBS, gastritis, and esophagitis because of the accident. And because at one point I kept vomiting so much, like my whole track was just messed up. So IBS is irritable bowel syndrome in which psychosomatic really, there really is no true root cause for it, but you can have constipation predominant, diarrhea predominant, or a mixture of both. Mm-hmm. I had constipation predominant. And then um, gastritis is basically when the acid erodes your st- the lining of your stomach. And so things like spicy foods, caffeine, whatever, right. makes it hard for you to eat and digest. And then like even hours later, I'm laying down and it feels like I'm dying and choking. It. <clears throat> and then esophagitis is basically the same thing. The acid is now not just in your stomach, but it's going up your esophagus. And I had all of that. So my mind... Me shutting down only made it worse because for those that don't know, the same serotonin that's in your brain is also in your gut. And so sometimes when you're feeling anxious or nervous and you, 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 your brain is feeling that way, you get the bubble guts or whatever, the butterflies. That's because of the serotonin connection. Or, or so, both. 
or both <laughs> or the opposite like something's wrong with your gut and now all of a sudden you're, you're feeling lightheaded you got a headache that's because of the connection so for me it's like I started exercising extra hard because I knew of this but yeah I was swallowing everything so I wasn't getting the healing and um so she got me to like express so much like she she was like I have to draw it out of you but then when I was expression she would like shrink because she was like everything you're telling me is about the responsibilities that, that you have and not about who you are what you are how you are and I was like uh, she was like you take yourself out of the equation but you put everybody else in an equation and mm -hmm. that doesn't make sense so you know and then she was like I need you to show up there's superpowers in ADHD I need you to understand that because you guys are risk takers she was like half the time you're talking you're going a mile a minute and I'm sitting here like her ADD is kicking in and I'm just like <laughs> what do you mean um and she was just like and even not just that but you guys don't hold grudges because <laughs> you don't have the capacity to hold on so much Let, <laughs> that's <laughs> so benefit, funny if it doesn't benefit you and I'm like you're right I don't hold grudges that's but I'll cut you off real quick I with the quickness don't if you let me get to the point where I say I'm done oh I actually mean it um wow yeah so she she was like analyzing me and she was just like everything I'm saying I see it in you but you're not seeing it in yourself so she was just like love the superpowers and work on the weaknesses that you're thinking ADH is um so she was able to like bring me around and help me out and so it was I was working on myself by myself I was working on myself with someone because with the Medicaid I had it wasn't therapists are hard to come by and so that was it and then in the background I am reading I am doing all this stuff harassing my brother harassing friends that have been business you know just doing all the research and you know just like I said I emailed like probably 50 people one month like I was just like I like they we met face to face for the first time on zoom and I was like this is my story how can you help me and like literally that was my question they was like how can I help you how can what help do you need and I was like everything help me out you know and so that that's that's what I did and I just kept plugging and honestly if it was a summit if it was something I signed up for it accelerator programs that were free if it ain't free it ain't for me so the free the word free had to be on it my email went there and that's how I got like swag bags. That's how I got to meet people. I got put into Slack groups. So it was like the connections. So, you know, it was me doing a lot of work on me first because I knew mm -hmm. I had to heal because to be an effective leader, you have to know how to lead and you have to know when and how to follow. And I did not want to be that leader because most people don't leave toxic jobs. They leave toxic bosses. And so I didn't want to be that toxic person. I've already had that moment when I wasn't acknowledging what was going on with me. And I was like, thank God for the friends that I got that still love me. Mm -hmm. But now it's time that you got to wake up. And then I had a son, a man child, who's going to grow up to be one. I am his heart, right? And so how I treat him is how he's going to allow other women to treat him and or the reverse, right? But right. I want to at least be the best I can as a single mom so that I can give to him in a good way and also move back with my parents so that he can see what a man looks like. I can't be the man. I can't. And I'm not going to feel bad for the decisions his father made. I cannot feel guilty for that decision he made. I didn't push anybody away. But at the same time, I had to be wise and say to myself, what am I going to do now? I can't teach him to stand up and be. I don't have the base in my voice, no matter how much I try. So, you know, there were steps that I had to do, suck it up, move back home after being on my own for so long and um, just be okay with it. Be okay with not being okay, but know that it's for the better. So, mm, be okay with not being okay temporarily, mm -hmm. but knowing that it's for the better. That's, that's, that's a clutch. That's, that's for one of those like kiki pearls. <laughs> Listen. That's a, that's a kiki pearl. That one's for free. I just, I love it. So then, <laughs> free gems here at the How Do You Medicine podcast. So yes. here you are. So you know, you knew that you needed or wanted some guidance. And so you were like, well, let me just reach out 
participate in any platforms that can help me reach out to anybody that I feel like can help me guide me through this part of my life. Mm -hmm. How did you come up with the doc you are name and concept? Like what was that moment like? Was that one, was it one of the um, um, events that you went to? Was it your coach? No, that's my brother. I asked my brother. Um, oh. And his friends, like, because uh, most of his friends are business minded and they either start a business, have businesses, failed and restarted. So I gravitated towards that. And honestly, anybody that's my friends is my brother's friends and vice versa. It's just that we don't necessarily harass them. Like we keep them separate unless there's cross collaboration. Um, and basically I kept talking to him and he was like, this is the sister I know. This is the person I'm used to. Um, and so, sorry, that put my laptop in. Um, so I was talking to him, he was like, that's not my forte. And that's how we are. Like, you know, when you know your strengths and weaknesses. So he directed me, directed me to one of his friends um, who was actually in Spain at the time. And he was like- What was, what was your request to him that he would, that he, what, what did he ask you to do? And you're like, that's not my forte. Um, my brother, oh, help me out with like the name, establishing the business, you know, understanding LLC versus this versus that. And he was like, yeah, I paid somebody to do that. I'm like, yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm not there. So you told I'm him, hey, I want to start a business around mental health. Uh, no, I just said I wanted to start a business. Oh. <laughs> and he was like, <laughs> okay, like, let, me, let me link you I was up like, with four the physicians. And he was just like, what about physicians? I was like, well, I want to help all physicians. He was just like, no. And then I, all right, eventually <laughs> I was like, all right, I want to deal with burnout. It's becoming this whole thing about burnout. And I was just like, okay. And it's like, it wasn't a new term, but it was a new term. And so I was just like, all right, so let me bring awareness to burnout. And then I was just like, I want to do it globally. He was just like, back up. Because the very thing you're trying to prevent for physicians is what you're going to do if you don't understand what to do. Figure out, do the research. My brother's big on doing the research. Um, so he was like, figure out what your niche is. And I'm like, what do you mean your niche? Oh, Listen, and that's something like, you guys will hear a lot on this podcast. <laughs> You know, one of the parts about how do you do anything, whether it's medicine or otherwise, yeah. is the, you know, because this podcast is health professionals doing medicine their way. The, mm -hmm. or doing, you know, in order to do anything your way, the N-word will come up. And not the yeah. bad N-word that we hear in all of us. Yeah. Media. I did think that person, I was like, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> no, uh, but niche will come up. Yeah. Niche will come up. And a, another way to to be to be more descriptive about niche niche is your specialty, your personal shape into in this world. There is a Dr. Kiki like you know shape in this world where that like she is a piece that goes you know to a place in the puzzle. This puzzle of like life, society, the chain reactions, the differences you'll make, the healing, the 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 uh, the inspirations and. The, the promotion of well-being. Everyone has their, a, you know, a, I have a Dr. Nancy Joseph shape, shape mm -hmm. uh, that I fit into. But in order to find that, there's the various things that have to happen, including evolution and development and stuff, all that stuff. But part of that is finding your niche. So niche is very important no matter what you're doing, because mm -hmm. otherwise you'll get lost. You'll get, because like, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. So if you mm -hmm. just go in there, you, everything's going to sound good. Everything's mm -hmm. going to look good. And then you're going to find yourself becoming in, because you're going to, you're going to go out there in the world and amorph, like in an amorphous, like amorphous, like brand, because you have no, it's like, it's like going out there with no, with no goal or mission statement. Yeah, pretty much. So you're going to become uh -huh. whatever you get exposed to. So yep. he's like, you really. and you're like, he's oh. like you're niche. and you're like, D okay. Yeah, it literally, it's like, bro, like, just help me out. And he's like, nah. So I, 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 Come I, on, I, brother. I, I, because he knows, he, he knows my temperament, my personality. He knows, like, I have to learn on my own. Like, you talking to me is like, okay, now what? But when you give me something and then I have to work on it, I am going to appreciate it better and I'm going to give back 10 times better. So he was just like, all right, you know, I'll guide you through. And so we're like, I stalk my brother, like text every five seconds, five o'clock in the morning, da, da, da. Um, and so he was just like, 
look at stats. You know, it starts with the market research. Look at the stats. So this is me learning terms and words because business and medicine are like somehow they do not connect. Like they don't, so, which is interesting. The, the, well, most stats. importantly, <laughs> business and medical training don't connect. Don't connect. But business and health, you know, and health practice, yes. yeah, businesses and healthcare mm -hmm. are intimately intertwined. They're not medicine. But so. businesses and healthcare training, no, they they there's very little interface there, or at and least not is, for the frontline workers, for the admin. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So for the frontline workers no. or physicians, so, we can speak yeah. to the physician training, and yeah. and that is very little. I think there are some. Um, facilities, uh, hospital schools that are trying to change that narrative, yeah. but by and large, yeah, for it's for just, the end for the end to be so intertwined, certainly the processes is not. Yeah, no, it's not. So I learned, I got more deeper into the stats, and that's when it started to like hit me about physician mental health, and like once again, I wasn't alone. Uh, you know, I was a little fish in a big pond, like not even a pond, like the ocean. Um, this, the, like, which is the biggest ocean? I don't remember. My son is teaching me all that now, the continents and the, the oceans and everything. Um, <laughs> so I don't remember what's the biggest one, Mediterranean? I don't know. Um, <clears throat> so it was just kind of like um, the stats really startled me. And then I'm doing the research and people are sending me articles here and there. And they're saying, Kiki, look at this, look at that. And it was just like, all right, so I'm doing something bigger than myself. And, right. you know, then it gets to that, those thoughts of me being small again. And I'm like this little black girl going into this big ocean with white men that don't really want to change. And you're talking about mental health, a subject that's not really well known. Will you be accepted? So I'm making myself small again. But when I'm reaching out to people, especially, it's funny, especially the white men, they're like, you need to do this you this is and then they're giving me little things to add and like I'm picking out whatever cherries or like little pieces of what they're saying resonate with me and I'm taking it and you know following up here and there to say all right I might need you again but not to lose that contact just because I reached out once doesn't mean I want this to be the end which my brother is like you have to ensure that you do build these relationships and don't just do one and done and use them these people so you got to keep them, them. Which, which is something when anybody in the high school and above asks me now, I'm like, your network, I need you to network. It's really not what you know, it's who. You'll be surprised of what doors open for you, even when you don't know, even when you have no option, but you have a dream, someone will invest in you because they see the passion and the reality in you. Um, so I kept, <clears throat> I kept at it and I, you know, once we got closer to something, my brother was just like, all right, now what's the name? I was like, I thought research was hard. Now the whole name was like, that's going to be your identity. That's, the, you don't want it too long. You don't want it to, and it's like these whole parameters. So that's when he was just like, here, I'm going to hook you up with my friend. And um, he helped me out. He even helped me out with the domain name, helping me out with like, which host I'm going to use, helped me build all of that. And he was just like, what name do you want? And so we would go through names and he's like, no, nah, I don't like this. And I like that. My Doctors Under the Radar came up because I was just like, throughout everything, I flew under the radar. People saw me. People heard about me. I started school with a sling on my arm and a boot on my leg. It's not like you didn't know something was wrong with me. But it was just like, I got by just under the radar. And I kept saying that, like, I'm just getting by under the radar. And then when I looked into it, I was like, oh, Doctors Under the Radar, I started Googling. And I was just like, there's nothing about doctors under the radar there's nothing really about under the radar except for like movies are the definition of it so I was like cool don't have to worry about that then it was like the domain name I'm like oh lord here we go I got a long name y'all telling me not to make the domain name long so it's like these little steps and bits and pieces and chunks and then when I'm thinking I'm getting somewhere they're just like you're not even a step closer to anything right now so then my girl she does like business legal stuff so she helped me like registration and like all these other stuff so it's like like I said the community the teamwork the effort I reached out to people I knocked on the doors of people that I knew and then I started knocking on doors that I didn't know and then within the market research I found people that were like market researchers and they helped with the questions my first market research I did I realized a lot of physicians like 
almost half physicians know about the stats, but a lot of them didn't know about like the gender disparities or like a lot of the details. And within there, one of the things was like, where do you want, how do you want your news, right? Or how do you want information? And podcast was the thing that had the most. And I was like, really? So now I got to do a podcast? Well, I actually didn't say that first. Somebody was just like, oh, you know what this means, right? I was like, yeah, I need to find a podcast or like have a whole list of podcasts. And they're just like, no, you need to do a podcast. And I was just like, no, that's that. No, that's no, not what that meant. That's not what that, what do <laughs> you mean? Not, that's not what, no. Is that and, what you and, heard? That's not what I mm-hmm. heard. I, and so they were like, all right, Google Physician Mental Health Podcast. So we're Googling and it's just like, so what are you going to give them? What resources are you giving them? If you're saying a podcast for mental health, what are you giving them? And I'm just like, you know what? All right, fine. So then now it's like (laughs) creating the podcast and, you know, all of that. And then the steps with that, not going to go into because that's a whole nother day itself. And, you know, with that, it was like, now I need a team. And, you know, even the team members that I have, my COO found me. He wants everything in my life is like random. I can't tell you. It's anything, it's blessings and it's, Serendipity. it's luck. It's blessing and it's God. Because he reached out to me the November of my, like September I launched, November, saying, I found you on a list. I'm like, what list? Like, I really, he had wrote a whole paragraph, right? And I responded back, what list? And it was like, I don't think that's how you were supposed to respond, but it was just like, what list? Um, and he's in graduate school and he was just like, you know, he's doing it early, but you're supposed to do like an internship somewhere. And so he wanted to do startups. His wife, you know, is a therapist. So he wanted mental health. He saw me, I'm a black startup female, so whatever. And that was November, January, he started and he's not my CEO. Like we are in sync. We think alike, like, you know, it, it's a blessing. And then even my interns that I have, I have five interns and they're working working and I'm not paying any of them but it's the mission and everything it is in turn to hire and then I have five advisors not one person is hunting me down for equity you know and I found one of them is my brother one of them is my brother's business partner so I have him as technology and his friend is like informatics so like information and everything data science and then the other three one was an advisor I got through an accelerator so I applied for accelerators and grants a lot so one of them is one my advisor for an accelerator and she stuck with me. Another one, I found her, I reached out to her and she was funny. She actually told me when she first saw me, she didn't think there was anything she could do for me. She thought that there was no hope for me because she said I sounded so defeated when I first reached out to her. Wow. That she was just like, I don't know how I'm going to help her, but something about her. And then by the second meeting, I was like, and she was just like, I saw her leaning in and I'm like, why is this lady getting close to the computer? Like, that's just not random. And she was like, you are not the same girl. I almost- Oh, wow. Yeah, so you you see, it's like showing up, you know? And I didn't know that. So her saying that, now I'm like every meeting, ha! And I'm not like that. So it was just like these random encounters and and in random moments in which um, I've gone about things and reaching out to people. Oh, the last one. I signed up for micromentor.com and I was just putting my information out there. Anybody that responded back, I reached out to them. So my actual first coach was from there. He was from the Philippines. So we always had to rearrange our schedules to fit each other in. So he helped me a little bit on the business side. And then I found a CFO, my CFO advisor right now. Um, He reached out to me. And from the very beginning, I think I met him in like October. He's been with me. And so now he's on my advisory board. And anytime I need him, he's there, he's helping me out. So, you know, in business, they tell you it's part luck, part this, because business is 50-50, right? 50% success, 50% failure. Those aren't good odds. So you really have to put in the time, the effort, the grit and grind. And not just that, but you have to believe not in what you're doing, but in yourself. Because everybody's like, well, I'm not going to tell my idea. Someone will steal it. Your idea isn't new, but you are your input, your value add, your expertise, your ignorance, whatever is going to do something that's going to make you different. So if you start off not believing in yourself, you can't expect someone else to believe in you if you don't. Like one of the questions that hit me hard was my brother asking me, where do you see yourself in five years from now? 
And I'll be like, I'm a doctor. What do you mean? I'm gonna be a yeah. doctor. That's not enough. And I was like, um, I'm a doctor. And he was just like, that's not enough. And he was like, if you don't see yourself in five years, I'm your brother and I'm not gonna invest in you in five years. I was like, dang, bro. Yeah, that's that's you're gonna that's, have to listen. I'm gonna have to if you don't believe no one's gonna believe in you if you no don't. one's gonna believe in you. So I carry that, and literally that's one of the questions I ask everybody. I don't care if I'm on a date, if I'm not talking to someone, where do you see yourself in five years? And it, you know, so it's important to know those things. So I had to believe in myself, and every time I had anxiety, I did it scared. I, I pushed through. Anytime I got nervous, I did it. And my actual wrote down, my models are aim to fail and five minutes a day. And I say aim to fail because in failure, you're at least trying, right? That means you did something. But when you're trying to be perfect, the fear of making a mistake stops you. So you're not doing anything. So uh, aim to fail, you're at least trying. And five minutes a day, girl, I don't care what it is. Even if it's just looking at emails. If it's a Wednesday, and there's so much piling up and I'm not feeling it, I stay at least do five minutes a day and I feel good. And I've accepted that. So that is the mantra I had to create for myself. At least five minutes a day, meaning productivity? A productivity of something towards my business. However, I don't even put a title to it. It's just five minutes a day towards my business to make me feel good that I looked at something for my business. Now I can look at one word for five minutes. I did something for my business. You know what I mean? And, and it's, it's, Sad, something but, is better but, than nothing. And then we tend to push ourselves when we have nothing left to give, right? Working from an empty cup. Like in the verses, it says, my cup runneth over. You know, not I'm working from an empty cup. So I've learned these, these things. And then, you know, I pick up the other days. Like instead of working nine to five, I'm not working nine to six. And I'm okay with that. And I put those buffers in the other days. I don't have a schedule. I'd be lying to you if I said I did. I have appointments, and if it's not on my calendar, I mean, my Google calendar, it doesn't happen, but I do not work well with a rigid schedule. So there's things where I have to implement within my day to make sure I'm on task. And so, you know, to answer any questions about how I got started and all these things, it's like blessings and God and mm. grit and grind. <laughs> grit, listen, grit and grind, blessings. So then that's kind of like, Hey, listen, you know, that's the brand working with a team, getting a team together, now doing a podcast, all of that stuff. And then now with other things coming down the pipeline, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but before you even, um, while you're doing all of this, you still found time to be a leader, right? Because a lot of times we can get stuck in what, you know, what they call imposter syndrome, where you're just kind of like, I'm still struggling to figure it out. How can I possibly lead someone? How can I possibly inspire someone? Right? We, you know, there's, again, an imposter syndrome or self-sabotaging. But here mm -hmm. you are, again, president and founder of that nonprofit organization and also an advisor to aspiring MDs. So talk to me about both of those and when and how you got even involved into in, in those. Because that's even one of them, because you're also like, a fellow or, you know, an alumni fellow and all that stuff. It's like, so talk to me about like those nonprofits and your leadership in that. And then somehow you end up finding the time to also be a fellow. Um, I'm also the chair of the sisterhood in my church and the youth advisor to the youth association. Um, so with all the with, time that you have in your hand, all the time that I have. Um, and so I found out about, the aspiring MDs because I was in what, a clubhouse or something. It was some event and somebody was like, you know, we need mentors for medical students or incoming medical students and we wanted somebody. And it took me a couple of days to sign up because I was like, who's going to want to hear from me, right? Um, but I did it anyways um, because early on as I'm starting this business, I am feeling still like I'm a doctor, but are people going to respect me as a doctor because I'm not licensed? And, you know, people actually called me out. They were like, I feel like you're still struggling, like you're struggling with imposter syndrome. And they were just like, one person cracked me up. They were just like, you have people with no degrees giving advice, but you got people with a degrees afraid to give advice. She was like, make it make sense. Somebody else right. was like, 
you got these homes on the street, like I, people get real with it, that don't know nothing from nothing. And they will be up in your face telling you what to do. And you actually did school for all these years and you ain't. So she was just like, we need to, we need to unpack that. And I was just like, are you right? Right. So you know you have the ones that stay diplomatic, and then you have the ones that are just like real and raw. Right, so, they're just like, let me just take these gloves off. <laughs> like, no, no, what do you mean? <laughs> so I, 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 I remember those words when I'm getting to that place where it's just like, who, you know, who's gonna listen to me? Who's gonna care or whatever? Um, and then people are just like, how many times has anybody ever asked you for proof of the fact that you're a doctor? I was like. You're right, you're right. But you can't Google my name. I'm literally the only way to spell my name is like, I'm the only, my name is not unique, it's Ethiopian, but it got lost in translation. So if you spell my name, literally will pull up everything about me. So you can find me. Um, so at the end of the day, it was kind of like, I just signed up and I have two mentees still. I meet with them almost every week. They're very lenient with my schedule when I'm like, uh, my schedule is crazy or I let them know you have to the week we're here please do three weeks in advance because my schedule is open you know Canonly is worldwide anybody can come on my schedule but I want to make sure I have time for you um, and then I have other mentors through my nonprofit organization which is founded by me and my cousin because we are orthodox and orthodoxy is the first original Christian church AD but at the same time, Orthodox in itself is strict. It's a very strict religion. It's like, she's like, yeah, let's go and see what happens. Um, so we started it. And we've been going strong since 2011. Like every year oh, we nice. do a, And that's the Orthodox Gems. The Orthodox Gems through my church. Every year we do a um, all expense paid um, retreat somewhere. We do like economical stuff. So they have to know how to manage and back, um, budget their money. They have to know how to cook. They take recipe. They cook recipes and take pictures of them doing it. And they these are what age? It. They are from ten to uh, my oldest one is what? So pretty much college. And even in college, we still keep in contact with them and let them know. And they register do. how? How do they register to the in the? They sign up. Girl, we have a whole form for them to fill out. <laughs> we even have a scholarship through it. So we raise funds for the scholarship. They they fill out through my church um, and everything like that. So I don't want people to feel like, oh my God, they got to be scared of me because it's not the customer is always right. It's your employees got to feel right for the company to be successful. Um, so for me, it's always kept that in mind and just understanding that um, Time is of the essence, and that's what I have a schedule for. And I do shut down. I don't open my laptop on Saturdays so that my son can see that mommy is here. I go to church on Sunday. And then a lot of the stuff that we have to do on Sunday is usually church-related um, and or relax. So that means Monday through Friday, I'm grinding. Tuesdays and Thursdays is my late day. Um, I still drop my son off pretty much every morning, pick him up Monday, Wednesday, Friday, unless I have stuff like this in which I didn't pick him up today because my father helps me out. So it's just calling on people and the community and relying on people to help me out and not feel like I have to do it all is why I'm getting things done. And I'm able to do as much as I can. And I shut down. I will shut something down real quick if I'm not feeling good. If I'm feeling myself get to a certain way, if I feel my mood change, if I feel certain things, I shut it down and I'm okay with it. I will say- You have to be a self-advocate. So yeah, have I have to. to, so like, cause I was just gonna ask like, how do you balance it? And you just already kind of like roll into that. So it's just like delegate, um, delegate, advocate for yourself and what you need. And then um, making sure to schedule. So schedule mm -hmm. things, delegate things, and, and, and making sure that you know you, you know what you need, and you not only that, but you honor. Sometimes we know what we need, but we don't honor that. You know you need mm -hmm. more than six hours of sleep, but you don't honor that. You know you mm -hmm. need to um, exercise and drink more water, but you don't honor that. So like, you know, because a lot of us, you know, uh, here, you know, at our brand, we just, you know, highlight and celebrate a lot of dynamic individuals, but balance is really key. And I always say balance is to be, um, it's to be maintained, not to be obtained. So it's not something that you Girl, even, like. I'm still on balance. 
Right. You don't get it. And then that's it. You, you know, you kind of, you always, you know, just like a tightrope walker has to always yeah. get little checks. That's how you have to do it. Um, so talk to me about now with all of this stuff going on and talking about all of that, there is something coming up next month, which is, I believe, Suicide Awareness Month in yeah. September. Um, and of course, we talked about both your personal journey through mental health and also your um, your brand journey so far to mental health. So talk to us about, um, as we round out, talk to me about this summit. It's an exciting summit that you have. And this is like the first year. So talk to us about what the, what, you know, the summit name, what's it about, that type of thing. Um, so once again, this is one of the things where I forgot what I was listening to and what I was doing, but something just said to me, you need to do something for your one year anniversary because my, the day I chose to start was September 17th, which is National Physician Suicide Awareness Day. Because as I was getting closer to, well, as I was doing the work, I almost did not start the company because I kept saying no. But I know if I didn't put a date out there, then it wouldn't have gotten done. And I know if I, that was me holding myself accountability. Like I am big on accountability. It's actually one of my values in um, my business. Um, and I put it out there for that day because it has meaning. So, you know, not just for like the company, but just overall in general for what I'm doing. And I said, I need something to mark my one year. And this was kind of like June. And I, I was listening to something and I texted my CEO and I was like, should we do a summit? And he's like, yo, bet, let's do it. See, this is the problem when you have people in your life that's just like, yo, let's do it. And I'm like, do we got time? He was just like, let's look at the month. If we start this and da, 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 we're fine. And I text somebody else and they were just like, go hard or go home. And um, that's how I got my first partner. And we were, and then we get back in and now it's grinding. And I'm reaching out and I'm like, yo, Nancy, you're doing this. You're free. Good. Well, you're coming. And it was it's like, we, you have this relationship where people are just like, are you free this day? Well, good, because you're going to do something for me. And that's literally what it's been like. And people have been rocking and rolling with me, helping me reach out, helping me do things. Once again, I leaned on my community. I let them know what it is, what it was, how it's been going. And they're just like, yo, we got to make this legit. And one of them was like, how about you push it back? Because it was supposed to be September 16th in honor of the 17th. And it was like, we're still in the month. You'll be surprised what those two weeks will do for you. It was a hard hit, but yo, those two weeks, blessing. Because 30 days out, you want to have, you want to make sure certain things are in place. So that gives me one week, which is one week of pushing time that we actually need with everything. We have people giving us discounts on the back end, like working for us for bare minimum. And this is, like, this, is a, this is a mental health summit, you're saying, it's right? Physician Suicide Awareness Summit. Because September is Suicide Awareness Month. The 17th is Physician Suicide Awareness. And so we're closing out the month with a summit. And what I feel truly blessed is because the keynote speaker is actually the founder, one of the founders of Suicide Physician Awareness Day. And so just even connecting with her, her helping me out, connecting me with this person, that person, half of the people that are working with me was a trickle down effect. Like I reached out to this person. They said they knew somebody, either they could or couldn't do it. Da, da, da. And, you know, we're going. So reality of it is, is like, I'm blessed. I'm glad I didn't give up on this because it's turning out to be amazing. I am meeting some phenomenal people. And then within it, I'm big on giving back. I am huge on my like, charity. Proceeds are going to benefit um, causes helping out physician suicide awareness and um, mental health. We have reached out to companies. We've already got one. Um, in partnership. And so we're just really excited about it. And then also we're partnering with small businesses, whoever has a brand, whoever has anything, services, consultation, so that we can create physician suicide, I mean, physician collective care boxes for the physicians, or we're given, having giveaways during the event. So we're pulling in the small businesses so that they can have access to this niche market so that our physicians can get the support and care and feel loved. And so it's just becoming this one big ball of happiness. Like we have three panels, a fireside chat, live demonstrations of beauty, um, like uh, mindfulness for like yoga and tapping and like a C two CPAs for personal and business. And we have about 
six different packages that we can give away and raffle away. So I'm really excited about it. And, you know, proud to see not even just me, but the team that I have and how we rally together. And I'm telling them, the more we push this and the more we get this thing going, we can get money and we can start getting paid. Well, not me, because, you know, you don't get paid immediately. I get to pay my interns, which I'm so praying for. Nice. And then, so would you say, so then that leads me, I was at, what is, what is, one or the most challenging thing in your journey so far and what's what have you been most proud of obviously the summit being one of them but i don't want to assume anything um what's been most challenging is as a small business and where you are the support is it's like information overload but not really any help so you really mm -hmm. have to do things and hope for the best and you have no anchor. So you're just kind of like floating and you have to just keep going with whatever guidance there is and still remember that just because you were guided that way doesn't necessarily mean you have to do it. And um, take that information, intertwine it with what you're already doing and you know, be PC and not burn bridges and like communicate and let people know what you've updated. So it's kind of like you have nothing but you're expected to do a lot. And so it's just learning how to navigate that, but through effective communication and just talking to people and being open and honest and saying, all right, let's jump on a meeting if we have to, um, it's been something. And thank God for our training where we say patients back to back to back to back, where I'm able to have these meetings and not feel like I'm losing myself, which there are moments where I do, because having 10 meetings a day is still a lot over Zoom. And what's been the most rewarding is, honestly, I will have to say, the other day, my brother called me and was saying he has a mentee and he was talking to his mentee, asking him, you know, all those poignant questions that he loves to ask and was just like, what are some of the things that you feel you need to have in business? And he was like, well, you know, money and da, 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 da. And he was just like, in all honesty, I'm learning through my sister that that's not the case. He was like, I'm actually looking up to my sister right now who has nothing and is making something from it all based on her hustle and her ability to see beyond and not be afraid. So I'm going to even change my mind frame of thinking you need to have money. And I was just like, my brothers? Like, talking to me like that? And he's been in business for over 10 years. Like, that was amazing to me. So just to see that, you know, that is resonating. And even in the last, the last I'm going to say, the last, accelerator I was in they were like Dr. Kiki you have a team of a thousand people and not one person is getting paid and you're rocking and rolling there was like that's a testament to your business your mission but you have to take accountability that's a testament to who you are and right. you have to understand that and not sit there and take it in like this grandiose like oh I'm the ish but just understand that whatever you're doing and whoever you are there's a light in you and they were like Honestly, people see. we're here yeah they're like we're here and we're seeing it and if there's anything you ever need you know so i'm just sitting here like this person that i kept saying was worthless that i kept saying had nothing to offer is now a beacon of light to other people or giving people support and even the feedback i'm getting from physicians from non-physicians is just like okay wow I still have those moments of imposter syndrome, anxiety or whatever, but sometimes listening, like thinking back on those words definitely helps me out and lets the day go a little bit smoother. I mean, that, and that's, and that is beautiful being able to have that testimony come full circle to say, and to see it like tangibly, you mm -hmm. know, you know, the answer to the question, why, why am I doing this? Why am I like to tangibly be able to have that confirmation from yeah. people that, you know, some, you know, well, and some you don't, and, uh, you know, and both of them alike being inspired by you, your story, your journey, and what you're doing thus far. So what would be, if you had to leave with like a, a piece of advice, like one big piece of like um, advice, what would you, what would you give our listeners? I would say don't do something thinking that it's meant for you to get something out of it. Sometimes to get something, you have to be selfless. 
And why I say that is because I started this out and I said, I want to do this so that people have more than me, have more options than me, do better than me. And, you know, at one point I was like, oh, I can do it. You can do it too. But that lasted for two seconds when I said, no, that's not the case. If I can do it, you can do it too. But I want you to do it better than me. I want you to have easier access than me. I want you to not have to struggle like I did. I want you to not have to, to you know, fall on your face like I did um, and be able to, if you do fall, pick yourself up because realistically we're all going to fall in love, faith, life, um, whatever it is. Um, but if I can be a vehicle, a tool to help guide the way or ease the pain or ease, like be a little buffer for the fall, I, you know, I'm, I'm ready to do it. So, you know, I finally, when I was asking God why in the very beginning, like, why do you have me here? It's like, you know, you're able to see it. So take yourself out of it and saying that I, 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 which we naturally do, like, I'm this, I'm that. Like, when I sit there and say, I'm scared, I'm this, I don't progress. But put yourself in it when you're trying to make yourself better, when you're challenging yourself, when you're analyzing yourself, when you're looking at yourself to say, what mistakes did I make yesterday that I can do better? How can I, you know, relate better to my team, my staff? How can I relate better to if you have a spouse, a partner, your kids, your parents, whoever it is? You know, it's try to maintain that balance between the, the what is it, the ego, the, the id, the subconscious, the conscious, the, oh. the narcissistic self and the non-narcissistic, you know, all the stuff is supposed to learn. Um, just, just be true, real, raw, and authentic to you yourself because the brand starts with you i learned about mm. branding and marketing but it starts with you so you have to balance how you're going to make that happen and like i said do it scared just just do it scared. that's the listen you heard it here and that's a great way to end this podcast with those three words do it scared because it's not you're not don't wait till you're not scared because you go that's gonna always be something you'll have to push through because like new levels new heights just like you'll be you know you were you were scared when you get to a new height you're scared but then you know that that excitement there's a lot of things that there's um the saying that says um fear is excitement on pause so mm. it's just kind of like okay all right just push through it do it scared dr kiki says <laughs> and with that, we'll, we'll end our podcast. We want to thank Dr. Kides Sharif, a.k.a. Dr. Kiki, for being thank our team guest today. Before we forget, go ahead and shout out your website, your social media handles, all that stuff. So my website right now, which we are in the midst of working, even that, we're working on a new logo, a new website domain, all of that in the midst of the summit the accelerated program, all that good stuff. Um, so it's www.m, as in medical, D doctor, under the radar.com. And to social media, it's not me, it's my intern. So if you do something and I don't respond, don't get mad at me. You know, um, it's DOC underscore the letter U underscore the letter R, or you can just like literally Google my name and you can find me on LinkedIn. That's where I respond better. Um, and spell, their, spell um, your name for them for people who are girl, you already know I'm like spelling my name oh that's true um <laughs> so what your what do you what you said with the website you said tell me the website again www.m as in medical d as in doctor so md under the radar.com okay so you guys can go to md under the radar.com you can go to dot um, d o c underscore u underscore r. That's on um, IG to get all things the doctors under the radar. Go ahead and um, follow that. Go ahead and take a look at the website and also stick around through the rebranding and changing and all that stuff. She's gonna do. Go ahead and follow this trailblazer um, and uh, you know stay tuned. And please, please go ahead and stay tuned for the next episode. But thank you so very much for tuning in. This episode full of Kiki gems, as I like to call it. Full of, full of Kiki pearls, actually. Full of Kiki pearls. Um, and, you know, and again, like Dr. Like Dr. Kiki said, make sure that you um, do it anyway. 
You know what I mean? You, you do, do it scared, you know? And of course, always here at the encouraging you and reminding you to live your life wholly, fully, on purpose, for a purpose, because you matter, your purpose matters, your dreams matter, and someone is depending on all of that. Um, and with that, we'll sign off. Thank you again for tuning in. Thank you again, Dr. Kiki. And please be safe out there. Be healthy. Stay blessed. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Stay tuned for the next episode. Peace. Peace. <laughs>